so right now, uh, the only formal filings that we've seen have been, well, there's been a bunch since the, the hearing, but really what we've got is Twitter's complaint. Uh, and then we just have the filings related to the motion to expedite. Right? So we don't have Musk's substantive defense. And, and it sounds like he intends to bring counterclaims as well. So, you know, we'll see what he brings. Uh, in the original purported termination letter that his lawyers sent, they raised, I think it was sort of three grounds uh, for this purported termination, not all of which requires uh, the May. So, for example, one of the things that they pointed to was, well, you know, the, the staff turnovers, you laid a bunch of people off, uh, you weren't allowed to do that under the contract. So that's something that doesn't need to have a material adverse effect in order to you know, bust the deal. I'm Evelyn Dueck, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, July 28, 2022. Today, we're bringing you another episode of our Arbiters of Truth series on the online information ecosystem. Unless you've been living under a rock, you will have heard that Elon Musk wanted to buy Twitter, and that he is now trying to get out of buying Twitter, and that at first he wanted to defeat the bots on Twitter, but now is apparently surprised that there are lots of bots on Twitter. It's a spectacle made for the headlines, but it's also, at its core, a regular old corporate law dispute. So I spoke to Adriana Robertson, the Donald N. Pritzker Professor of Business Law at the University of Chicago Law School, to talk about the legal issues behind the headlines. What is the Delaware Court of Chancery that Musk and Twitter are going to face off in? Will it care at all about the bots? And how do corporate lawyers think and talk about this differently to how it gets talked about in most of the public conversation about it? It's the Lawfare Podcast, July 28th, the corporate law behind Musk v. Twitter. Crossing now to our Delaware Court of Chancery correspondent, Adriana Robertson. Adriana, can you please describe the mood among among corporate law professors about the Musk v. Twitter legal drama today? Oh, we're elated. It's like our Super Bowl. Uh, Plus, all of a sudden, all of our friends and family actually want to talk about corporate law. So, you know, that's, that's pretty great. And... Certainly, I, for one, am excited to see what it does for my enrollments next year. Uh, it's just the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, that's right. Students uh, will, will really want to dig into that. I have to say it is it is really fun uh, working in an area that tends to be in the headlines all the time. It, although then at parties, uh, you you know, you become the doctor that has to like answer everyone's questions about what they're burning to know. OK, so before we get into more specifics, I'd love to know from you sort of how interesting or unique this case is as a matter of corporate law. I mean, we are all talking about it. And so it's really high profile. But is that the only thing that makes it sort of really interesting to, to outsiders or is there something novel here? Is there something that makes it more than just a spectacle that happens in more corporate buyouts? Yeah, you know, in some ways it's it's a pretty standard busted deal case, right? Like buyer signs the contract, buyer gets cold feet, uh, buyer wants out, seller says no way, you know, a deal's a deal. Uh, so, you know, that kind of thing, it's not it's not that unusual. I mean, most of the time it doesn't happen. Like usually if you sign a contract saying you want to buy this company, it's because you want to buy it. Uh, but it's also not that unusual. So we got to know how to deal with that. I guess the size is a little uncommon in a busted deal case. Uh, you know, $44 billion all cash is, you know, it's not small. Uh, and of course, you know, the, the spectacle is certainly special. So let's break it down a little bit beyond, you know, the, the, the way you described it as I think how most people would know it. You know, Musk agreed to buy Twitter, but now he doesn't want to. And so he's arguing that Twitter lied to him about how many bots were on their site. But, you know, as t- in terms of a, how it is as an actual legal transaction, when Musk and Twitter signed a merger agreement on April 25th, what actually happened there? Why is there this gap between signing that agreement and then this period where he's able to even try get out of it? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, there's a bunch of things that have to happen between the time the parties agree to a deal and the actual closing date. You know, some of that would be kind of familiar to anyone who's ever bought or sold a house, right? You sign the contract, but you don't close for a couple of months. You know, you may have, maybe your financing is committed, but you probably still have to finalize things with your lenders. You know, these things take a little bit of time. And then, of course, there are some aspects in an M&A context that are different from your kind of mental model of buying or selling a house. Uh, Like, for example, when you're buying a public company, the shareholders have to vote, right? Which means the company has to put together a proxy statement. It has to send it to the SEC. The SEC has to approve it. 
the vote has to happen. It has to be a positive vote. Uh, we're still waiting for that. So we still don't have a, a final proxy statement. So the shareholders can't vote yet. So we can't close the deal yet. Okay. So I haven't heard much about that. Is there a possibility that shareholders will vote against this now, especially seeing as it's ended up being extremely antagonistic and sort of wild? Oh, gosh. Um, I think that in this set of, I mean, look, in this crazy timeline that we're occupying, anything could happen. But I think given the current share price, it would be pretty odd for the shareholders to decline uh, to take a, a pretty rich offer compared to what the market value is or the sort of expected market value of the company, given that, you know, they're taking all cash, right? They get their cash, they get to walk away. They don't have to worry about what happens to the company thereafter. So I would be pretty shocked. Uh, there is a super fun wrinkle in all of this, which is that, um, as I think everybody alive on the planet knows, Musk is the second largest shareholder in Twitter, uh, which means he gets to vote. And uh, so, you know, the, the merger agreement obligates him to vote yes on the merger. But, um, you know, I look forward to seeing what happens. Yeah, exactly. Anyone that uh, that makes predictions about how this is going to play out is is usually wrong. Uh, that's what I've learned over the last few years. I think that's what everyone's learned. Okay, so let's talk about due diligence then. Can you describe what it is? I've seen it floating around those terms a lot. And can you describe, you know, there's been a lot of talk about Musk waiving his due diligence in terms of whether he had a right to say, I'm going to check out all the bots. And if they're not what you say they are, I can back out. What's going on there? Yeah. So that's, that's definitely not what the contract says. Um, it does not say that I'm going to check out the number of bots. And if I think there are too many, I get to back out. Uh, so, you know, diligence is, is just research that a buyer does into what she's thinking of buying. Now, normally that will involve like thousands of hours of associates time, uh, pouring over contracts and the like, right? Because the buyer wants to know what's under the hood before she decides she actually wants to own this thing. But, you know, for pretty obvious reasons, I think based on the way I just described it, that's something you would do before you sign a binding contract where you promise to buy the company. Uh, so, you know, Matt Levine uh, seems to be particularly annoyed by this semantic point. This is a columnist at Bloomberg that has been um, writing about this frantically over the last uh, couple of months. Matt Levine is amazing. Yeah, he's the best. <laughs> no offense, Adriana, but yeah, uh, I would direct people there. Absolutely. I do too. <laughs> I've been telling my students to sign up for his free, so you guys, it's free, you should do it, uh, for years, like forever. So anyway... You do due diligence to determine whether you want to go forward. You don't do it after you've decided that you're going to buy the company or not. Right now, it does seem to be the case that Musk didn't do much in the way of due diligence. Um, he seems to have kind of like jumped straight into the merger agreement stage of the deal. But that's sort of irrelevant once you're at the point of having a merger agreement. So let's go back to the bots because everyone's always talking about the bots. Musk said he wanted to by Twitter specifically because of the bots, actually. He, he, quote, wanted to defeat the bots or die trying, which makes it sound uh, like an epic battle between Musk and a bunch of robots. Um, but then he said he doesn't want to own Twitter because they'd lied about how many bots there were, which, you know, is, is somewhat uh, inconsistent. At the risk of hurting the feelings of any sentient bots that may be listening to this episode, do the bots matter at all to this deal? Are they at all legally relevant? Well, I think legally relevant is, is the right word there, because obviously in a causal sense, they kind of matter uh, because they're part of the, the reason for the purported termination, which you know, ultimately led us to where we are, right? Because one of the grounds of the purported termination uh, was that you know, the merger agreement appears to contain materially inaccurate representations about these bots. Right? Why is that? Well, it's because the merger agreement represents that Twitter securities filings don't contain any untrue statement of material fact. We love these sort of terms of art in corporate securities law. Right? So Twitter has been saying for years that its methodology indicates that there are less than 5% bots. Uh, so in principle, right, if Twitter's filings have been fraudulent, then that would be, you know, that would bust the rep. Right? Now, a busted rep on its own isn't enough for Musk to get out of the deal. Right, so just the fact that Twitter said 5% um, in its filings, they said that their filings were true, turns out their filings were false, it's actually not enough for Musk to get out. And the reason for that is it would 
also have to have materially adverse effect. Now, material adverse effect may causes, that's like a notoriously high bar uh, in Delaware. It has to be something that's pretty catastrophic. And I think it's fair to say that most observers think that that's going to be uh, tough sledding. Does it matter how badly they lied? Like if Twitter is 50% bots, which seems entirely unlikely, does that matter at all? I mean, maybe um, if it was really catastrophic for the company. But remember, it, it wouldn't actually even be enough that it has 50% bots and that the 50 cent bots were really bad for the company because it would it would have to be the case that the representation is false right so it wouldn't be enough for somebody to come along and use some like fancy machine learning algorithm that musk wants to use and discover that they're actually 50 percent bots right it would have to be something like uh twitter knew this or using twitter's methodology right it turns out that there were 50 percent bots or something like that right it, it has to be both the representation and the material adverse effect. So it's, it's a, that's a high bar. Okay. So I, I want to actually zoom out from the Musk deal a little bit on this point, because I think this is really interesting and something that I've been thinking about more broadly, which is how relevant content moderation is in terms of, you know, the, the, the representations or what shareholders should be thinking about, because in one sense, uh, as Talton Gillespie once put it, content moderation is the product that social media platforms offer. You know, on the one hand, of course, how platforms make money is ads. And so, you know, that might be thought of as as the product and that, that actually the product that they offer is user attention to advertisers. But on the other hand, it's also true that the main thing that differentiates one platform from another platform is how they sort and represent content. In other words, content moderation. So, in thinking about things like daily active users and growth trends of a platform, content moderation is actually really important as a business activity. And now we're in a position that in recognition of that, basically every major platform releases some form of transparency reporting around content moderation. So they'll say, you know, hate speech comprises about X number of pieces of content out of 100 that people see. And none of that is legally mandated. None of it has any legal status, you know, by and large, pretty much none of them are externally verified so they could be as accurate as monkeys dropping numbers on the floor but on the other hand you know people read them how much hate speech is on these platforms is something that people really care about in terms of like the public is there any argument at all that you know going forward or in the future these figures could or should be relevant and material to investors and shareholders it seems like they are part of a major reputational risk companies are taking flack all the time for the fact that they may not be uh, doing content moderation as effectively as they are representing. Is that something at all that could be could become relevant to corporate law um, as opposed to just, you know, what I think about? Is there any sort of possibility that at some point, you know, this could be something that investors push to be verified? You know, it's so interesting because this is, I think, one example of the difference between the way corporate securities people think about the world uh, and the way kind of like normal people think about the world. And in listening to your uh, description just now, it, it actually brings up a lot of the sort of key distinctions that we have in, in the, the corporate security space. And the first of those is between mandatory disclosures and voluntary disclosures. So We basically, by and large, only make companies disclose financial information. There's a little bit of management discussion and analysis and other stuff. Uh, But but by and large, the only mandatory disclosures are are financial. But there's all sorts of other things that investors might want to know about a company. You might want to know, I don't know, think like, how good is your reputation? You might want to worry about, you know, whether you have diversity in your, I don't know, on your board. I mean, we do make some mandatory disclosures about that. Uh, There's all sorts of demands for diversity audits. Why? Because the concern is, hey, uh, this is going to be a really big reputational risk. Those things are typically not mandatory. But if investors want them, investors can demand them. And so there's a big distinction there. And then there's another big distinction between uh, what you are required to say and then Conditional on having said something, can that thing be misleading? So there's plenty of things that a company is not required to disclose, but 
if it should choose to disclose them, then it would be a violation of the securities laws if it was materially misleading in that statement. Yeah, but it would be choose to disclose them to the SEC or in these filings as opposed to in these sort of transparency reports that they post on their blogs. Like, do those matter at all? Well, I guess the question is if they incorporate them by reference into their, uh-huh. you know, 10, 10Ks, 10Qs, whether they file them as 8Ks. Oh, yeah, as 10Qs and, and 8Ks. I did totally all that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, you know, annual reports, quarterly statements, and then just ad hoc filing. So, you know, a fun thing that, that everybody in corporate law, if you're ever wondering why everybody in corporate law you know, saw the merger agreement right away and, like, knows, seems to know what's going on here, it's because public companies are great. Uh, They're required to file all of their material contracts with the Securities and Exchange Commission, which means, you know, you go on their website, uh, you search up the company's name, you pull up the filing, and and you too can read these material contracts. It's great. Doesn't work for private companies, only works for public companies. But, you know, just to to get back to your question, I think it's, it's the SEC and the securities laws are in a tough spot, because on the one hand, they're making mandatory disclosure rules, and they don't want to have different disclosure rules for each you know, industry or each type of company. But at the same time, it's obviously true that different information is sort of important uh, for different types of companies at different points in time. And so you know, we're kind of trying to walk that line between deciding what to force everybody to disclose and you know, tailoring things in a way that just gets kind of out of hand. So you can think of the kind of private ordering versus you know, public regulation approach. Yeah, and I guess before we should get too excited about shareholder activism, which we've maybe seen being really important in the in the climate context, these companies tend to have pretty peculiar uh, shareholder uh, structures that mean that owners and founders and CEOs have controlling shares, which I suppose makes this lever for change, um, even if you believe that this is something that is not only socially relevant and a, and a social good to be really good at content moderation, but also a business, a factor for business and, and, and business risk. Would I be right in understanding that there's some, some of these peculiar ownership structures uh, preclude this being a really strong lever in this context? I mean, you know, so meta, obviously, it's not, it's not clear how much, you know, disgruntled investors can actually do. In something like Twitter, I mean, yeah, they, it's a public company, widely held lots of different investors. If it was clear that investors were upset, they own the company, right? They can tell the board, we really want this audit. Uh, We want you to to actually audit it. And then, yeah, if it turns out that it's materially misleading, then that's securities fraud. Uh, So, you know, I think it depends a little bit on how effective you think the current structures of corporate governance that we have are. If you think that you can get a little bit Panglossian, right? You're like, well, you know, everything is for the best and the best of all possible worlds. The fact that we don't see this means that investors don't actually care about it because if they cared about it, then they would, you know, require companies to do it. And so, you know, we can all go home now. That's kind of one extreme uh, of the, the corporate governance approach. The other approach is, no, 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 everything's market failures. Investors are asleep at the switch. There's all sorts of agency problems when it comes to institutional investors. So we have to impose a lot of you know, requirements on these companies because otherwise the market's never going to do it. Um, And I think essentially where you come down on that will more or less determine uh, what you think is happening in this particular context, just like every other context. Okay, so let's go back to Musk then. The case is now in the Delaware Chancery Court, which sounds very fancy and futile. And so, of course, given that this has to be absolute maximum drama all the time, of course, this case is going to something that sounds uh, way more spectacular than a regularly named court. What is the Delaware Chancery Court and why has one of the most high profile legal dramas ever um, ended up in a court that most people have never heard of? So its formal name is even fancier. It's the the Delaware Court of Chancery. Oh, Uh, wow. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I hope they don't come for me and and arrest me for for being so insulting. (laughs) Yeah, so you're right. Most people call it the Delaware Chancery Court or just Chancery because really, you know, what other Chancery Court would we be talking about? I'm a little puzzled that everybody, that I've since seen the Chancery Court described as being obscure because, you know, in my little corner of the world, it is anything but. But then, you know, I have to remind myself that, like, 
normal people don't do this uh, all day long. So, uh, so what is the Chancery Court? Well, it's a, a state court in Delaware. Uh, it's a court of equity. So what does that mean? It means there are no juries. Uh, everything is just decided by the judge. And why Delaware? Well, as I know you know, and, and many listeners probably also know, most of the biggest companies in the country are incorporated in Delaware. Right? So about three quarters by market cap and I think half in size. It's sort of like the corporate law jurisdiction in the country. Right? And so what that means as a consequence of being incorporated in Delaware, the corporate law that applies to you is Delaware law. And so if there's a dispute under corporate law, it's going to be heard in Delaware. And it's going to be heard specifically at the Chancery Court. Right? It's, it's highly specialized. Right? So there's one chancellor, uh, Chancellor McCormick, and four vice chancellors. And they're all extremely knowledgeable about corporate law, highly specialized. It's viewed as being one of the key reasons why companies like to be incorporated in Delaware, because then they know that any disputes will be heard by the Chancery Court under Delaware law. Okay, so I want to get back to what that means in terms of why companies like that, and in particular, whether it's more predictable than than in other courts or other areas. But I am stuck on the idea that this is kind of wild, that this whole thing is going to come down to the opinion of one woman, which is Chancellor Kathleen McCormick. What can you tell us about her and the, the, the pressure that must be on her in this moment, um, given, you know, all this public attention, which, you know, you're used to paying attention to her, but maybe she's not uh, so used to being so uh, in the headlines so much? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, in, in federal court, you normally have one judge. Um, and if you have a bench trial, everything comes down to that judge. And besides, you know, can't the court, I don't know anything about civil procedure, but can't the court like overturn a jury verdict if they think that it's like unreasonable or something? So in some ways, it's not that different from any other court, uh, particularly any other bench trial. Um, and, you know, you, you can still appeal to the Delaware Supreme Court after all. So it's not like she can do whatever she wants and there's, there's no recourse. But, you know, I, I think your point is still well taken. This is high profile and what she thinks is important and what she's going to do is important. So, you know, she is extremely well respected. Uh, she's very no nonsense. Uh, you know, she here's just to give you one anecdote. She actually moved the hearing last week to Zoom. It was supposed to be in person because she came down with COVID, but she didn't want to delay the proceedings. So she just you know did it on Zoom so you could hear her kind of like scratchy voice uh, mm -hmm. as she was talking. And she apologized that, you know, one of the symptoms was that her voice was kind of scratchy and, you know, don't take it to mean anything other than the fact that she was doing this with COVID. So, I mean, she's a total boss. I think that if anybody can handle it, she can. But, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot, but that's her job. And in terms of thinking about, you know, again, this idea of predictability and what the parties uh, might be thinking or hoping as they go into this, is there anything about this judge that is particularly relevant to this case? Well, so one of the things that the Chancery does is they kind of informally sometimes specialize, like the, the chancellors and vice chancellors on specific companies. And so, you know, she is also the person who's going to hear the trial or the, the dispute uh, related to Musk's compensation at Tesla. Um, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, that is it's also amazing. scheduled for October. So, you know, they're going to be seeing a lot of each other uh, that month. Besties. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to be BFFs by the end. And then, of course, the other thing that's just worth noting is that uh, just last year, she, she did order specific performance when a buyer got cold feet on a deal. Um, and in doing so, she described it as a, a victory for contract certainty. Right? So obviously, there's no guarantee that she'll do that again in this case. But, you know, certainly it's an indication that she's not afraid to order specific performance in a, a busted deal. So the parties obviously know that, you know, we should pull one out for the lawyers that are working around the clock now for a trial in October. But I, I guess given that, given that track record, you know, does that increase the likelihood of some kind of settlement? Do you have a feeling of like, how often do these cases settle and how often do they actually go to trial? Should we be clearing that week in October or uh, do you think it's going to sort of uh, something else is going to happen before then? Accepting, of course, with the caveat that we're not going to hold you to any predictions. No one knows what's going to happen between now and then. But, you know, if this were a normal case, what might happen? Yeah. So, you know, they say predictions are, are always hard, especially when they're about the future. 
<laughs> so I'm clearing that week. Well, I actually don't know what the week is yet. I don't know if it's actually been uh, released, but I have every intention um, of being available those days. But at the same time, you know, I think it is fair to say that there's a high likelihood of some kind of settlement between now and then. Again, who knows? But it would be, I think in a normal case, be a little bit surprising for this to go all the way to trial only because it's a pretty straightforward contract dispute. Uh, so unless Musk has some kind of ace up his sleeve or you know something crazy comes out in discovery, it would seem to be reasonable to expect the parties to settle. Uh, but nothing else about this case has been particularly reasonable so far. So, you know, I wouldn't put much stock in that. Can you think of anything that might be an ace up his sleeve or something that might come out in discovery that could could change that? Is it or is that just, you know, like, oh, we still have the capacity to be shocked in, in this case? Like, is there something that you can imagine coming out? Well, yeah, I mean, apart from the fact that he seems to have like a reality distortion field around him. And so who yeah. really knows what's what's going to happen? Look, so if it turned out that uh, he's got some employee or former employee of Twitter uh, who can show that Twitter has been lying about the bot numbers, right? And so there is, in fact, a material misstatement and that, you know, it is kind of like catastrophic for the company, then, then yeah, that would change things a lot. I think it's you know, a, a little bit unlikely that he's got that ace up his sleeve, but uh, at least I can, you know, imagine the writers coming up with a plot that would allow that to happen. Yeah, this is feeling a lot like a season of succession at this point, um, rather than, you know, a normal corporate law deal. So given that um, any anything could happen, thank you, writers. Okay, so let's talk about the first hearing then, which happened last week. So I tried to dial in, but the line was at capacity, which I'm curious if that happens very often. Um, again, the, the the Court of Chancery in Delaware is is having a, a wonderful time. It was only a preliminary hearing about this idea of the timeline, but did it signal anything about the broader dispute and, and what, what exactly happened and, and how might it play out from here? Yeah, you know, you're not the only one who, um, who couldn't join the line because it was full. Another friend of mine who actually teaches m and uh, also couldn't get on the line. So I was pretty happy that uh, I called in a little bit early. Uh, so it was super fun. Uh, it was on, as you said, sort of the formally, it was a motion to expedite. But you're right, it's basically when's the trial going to happen, right? So Twitter asked for a four-day trial in October. Massa asked for, I think it was a 10-day trial uh, in February. Uh, and McCormick decided on a five-day trial in you know, October. <laughs> So, you know, in that sense, I guess it was a lot closer to what Twitter had asked for than what Musk had asked for. Now, she didn't come out and say something like, and don't bother me with this bot nonsense. Not that anybody was really expecting her to do that. But if she had, you know, I think that would have been pretty devastating for Musk. But there were a few points in time over the course of the hearing as I was listening in that, you know, I had Twitter's stock price open in another browser window and you could see the reaction. So surely there were some people uh, who were, you know, playing the market, who are also listening in on the call because you could watch it happen in real time. It's, it's pretty fun. <laughs> that's that's hilarious. So this has been billed as a huge win for Twitter. As you said, the, the result was a lot closer to what Twitter wanted. But I guess a relevant question there is, you know, w- what's the status quo? Like if Twitter is just arguing for what would normally happen and Musk is arguing for something completely outlandish that is a departure from regular procedure, then it's not so much a win for Twitter as, a, a, I guess, a loss for Musk in asking for something completely unusual. So is this how it would normally proceed? Uh, is this expedited trial normal in this case? I mean, it, it's quick, not unheard of quick, but it is quick. I do feel you know, really badly for all of the associates uh, that are basically going to be you know, working day and night between now and October to get this stuff done. I think it is fair to say that the February date that Musk side was asking for was probably unlikely to happen. Uh, but you know, I would not have been shocked if McCormick had decided on a trial in November or something. Uh, so, you know, in that sense, I don't think that I don't think it's quite right to say, no, no, uh, this was totally par for the course, nothing to see here. Uh, but it certainly wasn't like, super duper extraordinary either. And so why would Musk want to drag it out 
that much? Like, is it just that he hopes, his legal team hopes that the more time they have to sift through discovery and everything that they find, that they the, the chances of finding some smoking gun might be higher? Or is there some other reason that it's beneficial for them to have it go on longer? Okay, well, so so there are there are good faith reasons why you might want to drag it out, and there are less good faith reasons why you might want to drag it out. I can't believe you'd suggest that in this case, um, but I'm still very curious <laughs> to hear what you think they might be, of course, given that they're definitely not that, but just hypothetically. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, uh, good faith reasons, right? You just need lots of time uh, in discovery to get to the truth, because after all, as his counsel argued, you know, this is super duper complicated and we need to, you know, do all sorts of really fancy technical work to get to the bottom of the number of bots. Again, I think most people think that's sort of a little bit implausible given the contract language. So there's there is one sort of uh, fishing expedition explanation, right, which you kind of pointed to, which is, well, you know, uh, it's a bit of a Hail Mary. Like, if you don't have a particularly good argument, you might as well just sift for as long as you can until maybe you'll find one. And then there's another not so good faith argument, which is you can think about Musk is essentially owning kind of like an out of the money derivative sort of, I mean, it's not really an option because he's supposed to actually buy the thing, but maybe he won't have to buy the thing. There's some probability that he'll win. And so when you own something that's very, very, very out of the money, time is your friend, right? Because all sorts of things can happen between now and say February uh, or December or whatever else. And so the longer you can delay, the higher the likelihood that something good will happen in the intervening time. And so it makes total sense to me that he wants to drag it out for as long as possible. And in terms of that, you know, sifting through the evidence, does that have to be relevant to bots now? Like, are they bound to that? Or could it really be that they can look for anything that might have a materially adverse effect uh, in this case and bring that in October? Like, could we be surprised or shocked to find that this case actually ends up being about something that no one has talked about so far? Uh, I mean, in principle, they could. So right now, uh, the only formal filings that we've seen have been, well, there's been a bunch since the, the hearing, but really what we've got is Twitter's complaint uh, and then we just have the filings related to the motion to expedite, right? So we don't have Musk's substantive defense. And and it sounds like he intends to bring counterclaims as well. So, you know, we'll see what he brings. Uh, in the original purported termination letter that his lawyers sent, they raised, I think it was sort of three grounds uh, for this purported termination, not all of which requires uh, the May. So, for example, one of the things that they pointed to was well, you know, the, the staff turnovers, you laid a bunch of people off, uh, you weren't allowed to do that under the contract. So that's something that doesn't need to have a material adverse effect in order to you know, bust the deal. And so in the ruling, McCormick suggested that a delay might cause irreparable harm to Twitter. Why might we think of that? You know, you suggested that one of the reasons Musk might want to drag it out is to the hope that something uh, good could happen for him. If he does end up having to buy the company, irreparable harm to Twitter sounds pretty bad. What was she talking about there? So uh, from a, a legal perspective, right, the reason she was talking about irreparable harm is because that's part of the legal standard for granting a motion to expedite. So she's a good, a good jurist. She wants to make sure that she's addressing uh, the legal standard and that's part of the legal standard. Uh, so that's sort of the sort of but for legal explanation for why that came up. Uh, in terms of the irreparable harm, does this seem plausible? What's going on kind of under the hood? It's sort of funny. You you hinted a little bit at the argument that Musk's side made, which is, look, Musk owns 9% or something of this company. He's the second largest shareholder. Why would he want to hurt the company? Uh, there's some probability that he's going to end up buying it. And even if he doesn't end up buying it, he's a big owner of this company. So essentially, their argument is it would be against his interest to do anything uh, that would hurt Twitter. Obviously, that is not uh, Twitter's view. Twitter's view is that, no, he's been making all sorts of statements that are. Can you really characterize tweeting a poop emoji as a statement? I mean, I think that's a very generous uh, interpretation of, of that. <laughs> a, a sentiment? Can we call it a sentiment? Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's Definitely. something. I mean, the other thing to say, I think, I don't think it's unreasonable to say that this is kind of like pretty distracting for Twitter's management because they're busy responding to poop emojis and, yeah. <laughs> you know, talking to the press and like just being generally miserable 
I take it. This by they seem to be just like generally pretty miserable, and it's hard to blame them. And that's not great for a company when its management is distracted. We usually think that you know, it's hard work to run a company, and you want people to be focused. And every day that they're distracted is a day that they're not, you know, doing their best work to run this company. So what can we expect to see a trial then? You know, given that people are watching this um, with expectation, people are going to be getting the popcorn out. I imagine I certainly will be. But is the trial actually going to be fun at all to watch? Like when we're probably not going to have Musk on the stand yelling something like, you know, you can't handle the truth. But but what kind of thing should we expect to see? Or, or again, is that too hard to predict at this stage? Well, I think, again, like to be fair, I don't know that the median trial put aside, you know, the Delaware Chancery fixed effect, I don't think the median trial has people screaming, like, you can't handle the truth, or like, aha, you just got a perm, you can't take a shower. Like, that, <laughs> it doesn't really, like, happen that often outside of movies. So neither does this. To be, to be fair, I don't know if I would call or expect this to be the median trial. No, 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 totally, totally. Um, I think, you know, look, I, for one, intend to tune in, as I, as I said, for the time being, right, the parties are busily serving requests for production and interrogatories. Uh, the first ones hit the docket the day after the hearing, so they're, they are keeping themselves quite busy. And then, of course, we're going to have depositions. Uh, so I can imagine some of those being interesting. I don't know what ultimately is going to happen uh, at trial or, as we said, if there's ever even going to be a trial, because that's going to I mean, depend a lot upon what comes out of discovery. And so do you have a prediction of what might happen here? I think it's fair to say that in, you know, the echo chamber or bubble that I'm in on Twitter or in the media that I read, people seem to think that this is basically a slam dunk for Twitter, although I know that not everyone thinks that. What's the legally informed view of the likely outcome here? I think uh, I think a lot of people... So first of all, I think the consensus is that Twitter has a a very strong case. It's always possible that there's some ace uh, being held up for later. Now, it's not really clear why you wouldn't have just played it already if you had this ace. Uh, But in any event, you know, there's some probability that that could happen. And then given that, I think the the general thinking is that there is a, a high likelihood that there will be a settlement in the shadow of the likely decision by the court because uh, it's like not great to be deposed and you have to go to to Delaware and it's like kind of far and then, you know, you have to stay there and, you know, most people would rather avoid that. Ouch, sick burn on Delaware. No, 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 no. Like, I love Delaware, but, you know, like, Musk is a busy guy, you know, he lives in Texas, he'd have to go all the way to Delaware. It's kind of like a pain, right? Right. You'd rather just move on with your life, I would think. So speaking of things that are a pain for Musk and might prevent him from moving on in his life. If this does go to court or as part of the settlement, um, Musk is either ordered, uh, you you mentioned this term before, that there's specific performance, um, the court orders specific performance. I, I would like you to sort of unpack that a little bit and or whether it's part of the settlement that Musk is ordered to run Twitter but just doesn't really want to. <laughs> is there a capacity to force him to? And And what happens in that case? Yeah, so, so, so what is specific performance? It is, it, it's an order by a court to do a thing, right? in the most general possible terms, uh, a, a specific thing, to perform a specific thing, um, as it were. So it, the distinction, of course, being uh, what can a court do? It can order you to pay damages or it can order you to do a thing. And so Delaware Chancery Court can and does uh, order people to, to do things, including buy companies. Uh, now, one... Distinction, of course, um, there's a huge distinction in Delaware corporate law between owning a company and running a company, right? In fact, when you think about the way, again, people in corporate law think about corporate law is that there is this separation of ownership and control. And essentially, the entire architecture of corporate law exists to manage the problems that this creates. So, you know, to be clear, if the court order specific performance, Musk would be compelled to buy the company. Uh, but he wouldn't be compelled to run the company, right? So in principle, nothing would have to change about the way the company is run. You could keep the same management team. You could keep all the same policies. Uh, He's just a 100% shareholder instead of being a a 9% shareholder. Right now, uh, I think it's fair to say that that's not terribly realistic in this case. I think 
Uh, seems a little unlikely that the existing management team is going to stick around. But, you know, in principle, you could just hire somebody else to do it. So we don't have to order him to actually run the company to get this deal done. Okay, so because Musk, of course, has been representing publicly that he wants to run the company because he thinks he can solve the intractable problems of Twitter, um, that it's a public square that's not being adequately managed. And he wants to come in and not only defeat the bots, but stop the censorship and, you know, all of those sorts of things. Um, although he oscillates on what he thinks would actually be good. I mean, he clearly hasn't really <laughs> thought this through, but to the extent that he has thought it through, it seems like he wants to do things uh, if he ends up owning the company. But what you're suggesting is that if he gets tired of that or distracted, he could end up as an owner. Uh, he could be ordered, the specific performance could be ordered, but Twitter might not actually change all that much because he doesn't get his hands dirty in the day to day running. Yeah, I mean, I, I so I completely agree with you, and that's part of the reason why I think it's said it's pretty unlikely uh, that the existing management team would stay unchanged. It's just that I do think it's important to keep in mind uh, because this is one of those things that is totally second nature in corporate law and like totally bizarre to like regular people, uh, which is we don't really think about the ownership and the management as being one in the same. And so it would be truly, truly bizarre to compel Musk to run Twitter. That would be just odd, but it wouldn't be that odd to compel him to buy Twitter, at least, you know, as we think about corporate law. And so uh, now, again, as a practical matter, maybe that's a distinction without a difference, but you know, we're not going to like make him sit in the headquarters and like force him to make decisions, especially given, you know, an unwilling CEO seems like a, a pretty bad idea. I want to go back to the thing that you started that answer with, which is the gap between something that is completely second nature for, for you in corporate law, but uh, may not be how we think about it as corporate law novices, although many people on Twitter uh, are purporting to be corporate law experts. Um, Is that before or after they were constitutional law experts? And yeah, that's right. Also, and, and, also infectious disease experts. Right? Correct. Uh, it's amazing <laughs> the capacity that people have to, to skill up in certain areas so quickly. <laughs> but for, for those of us that know that we know nothing, I'm curious about this 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 difference in perception of, of what's going on here. So you pointed me to a great piece by Anne Lipton that title uh, that was titled uh, "The Entire World Is About to Get a Lesson in Revlon," and I'd love you to sort of unpack that a little bit because I think it makes a really important point that something that's not intuitive to me or the commentariat that are, are watching this, um, but is totally uh, intuitive to you. Yeah, so much like Matt Levine, uh, Anne Lipton is amazing, and you should definitely, definitely pay much more attention to her commentary than to mine. So, you know, I think the, the point she was making is just, we live in this super warped framework of corporations and, and corporate law, where when it comes time that a, a company wants to sort of sell itself, which is what Twitter has decided to do, it's selling itself for all cash then you know, the only obligation that the board has is to the shareholders and to maximize the payoff to those shareholders. And you know, once this deal is done, that's it. It's over. It's kind of like the old Twitter is gone. There's a new Twitter. Formally, this isn't even, I mean, we call it a purchase and we call it a sort of people refer to it as a buyout, things like that. It's actually a merger, right? So old Twitter is going to merge into this sort of shell company that Musk set up and he owns this shell company. And that's going to be the outcome of this deal. Right? And so when we think about the obligations of the selling board, what we're interested in is, you know, the payoff to the shareholders. And when we think about the way Delaware corporate law is going to think about this merger, that's the way it's set up to think about it. Um, there's a famous case, and that's what uh, Anne was referring to, Revlon. So like, the easiest way to tell the difference between a corporate nerd and a regular person is to walk down the makeup aisle at a CVS and judge their reaction when you get to the Revlon products, right? Because we all kind of like smile a little bit because we're like, oh, Revlon, <laughs> it was the Delaware Supreme Court case. And everybody else is like, oh, look, makeup that I used to buy when I was 12. <laughs> and, and But that's what she's talking about. It's this obligation that once you decide to sell a company for all cash, it's just about the money. It's just about the maximum payoff to the shareholders. Nothing else matters. And then there's that question of the decision to buy the company. Because I think one of the things that's really interesting in that piece 
was, you know, a lot of the commentary has been about what Twitter wants, what Twitter would be thinking. Would this be, you know, good for, for good for Twitter? What would Twitter want in terms of, you know, seeing this deal play out? It wouldn't want it because, you know, it's been doing all this hard work to clean up its platform. And then Musk has an entirely different vision for how Twitter should run. So those desires are inconsistent. But Twitter is not a thing, really. I mean, <laughs> it is clearly a thing. I spend a lot of time on it. It exists. But Twitter doesn't have motivations and desires, right? And, and why is that? Well, right. So, you know, it's it's funny because the way normally, right, we do, we have this legal concept of corporate personhood, right? Corporations can enter into contracts and uh, evidently, you know, they can also like express religion. I don't know. You're the First Amendment person, but as I understand it, um, something, something Hobby Lobby. So in the ordinary course, corporations can consider whatever, what they want. Uh, and we have this thing in the ordinary course called the business judgment rule, which says that you know, managers can use their business judgment to decide what's good for the company. So in the ordinary course, it would be totally fine for Twitter's board to say, look, we care about the long-term health of this company. And so we're going to engage in all sorts of things that are in the short run, maybe not great for investor returns, but that's because we think in the long run, it's going to be good for the company. There's this famous case. It's actually not a Delaware case, but it's still the case everybody points to. Um, I'm sitting here in Chicago and uh, there's a famous case about Wrigley Field. Uh, at the time, there were no night games at Wrigley Field because they didn't have lights at the stadium. And uh, shareholders got upset and they said, you should install lights so that we can play night games because those are super cool right now. This was a long time ago, obviously. Yeah, and in Chicago, that cuts out like a large portion yeah. of the day for a very long part of the year. <laughs> well, I don't know how much baseball they play in the winter. But anyway, um, you know, this is like super cool and we should do night games because all the cool stadiums are doing it. So the, the shareholders sued. And the management said, no, uh, we care a lot about having good relations with the neighborhood. We think that in the long run, that's actually good for us to not sort of annoy our neighbors. And that was that was held to be fine. You can consider those long run interests of the company, even if in the short run, it's going to hurt the payoffs to the shareholders. So in the ordinary course, we actually do in corporate law think about, oh, the company can have um, sort of a long run vision for how it wants to run itself. But once you decide to sell that company for cash, that's when you enter the Revlon zone. And that's when you find yourself in the place that, that Anne was talking about, which is it doesn't matter what's good for Twitter because the shareholders, the existing shareholders are going to have their cash and they get to just like go along with their lives. It doesn't really matter if it's good or bad for this company because that company doesn't really exist anymore. It's been cashed out. It's gone. There is no more long-term value of Twitter to try to steward. And so that's the distinction that we have with Revlon. So, you know, we are both coming at this from very different angles. It's exciting for both of us. This has been a great lesson for me in corporate law, but it also strikes me that corporate law, you know, doesn't really see the things that I think about when I think about this deal, which is, you know, the political implications, the free speech implications, the public policy implications of what might happen here, you know, whether or not Twitter is the quote unquote public sphere, it's clearly very important to public discourse uh, in this day and age. And so, you know, the idea that it might be run completely differently or say Donald Trump might end up back on Twitter in the run up to the 2024 <laughs> election, um, as Musk has promised to do, you know, that seems kind of relevant to this conversation, but it doesn't really seem, you know, we haven't mentioned it yet today in, in talking about what's going on. Um, so, you know, it, it's kind of the, this this butterfly effect theory of what might be going on here, which is that, you know, if Musk is uh, forced to go through with a deal, um, he might let Donald Trump back on Twitter. People think that Trump's influence on Twitter is such that it's, you know, a key cause of his electoral success. So that increases his prospects in 2024. And we are back to a, a Trump presidency. Is Chancellor McCormick allowed to think anything about any of that? And, and is that at all relevant? Or are the precedents so clear in this corporate law area and, and none of that uh, will, will come into play? I mean, like, you know, she's allowed to think about whatever she wants. And look, I mean, again, she's like a person alive in the world. So I'm, I'm completely confident that she knows about all of this. Uh, but, you know, I think the, the real question is, 
is this a matter for Delaware corporate law and the chancellor of the Delaware Chancery Court to decide, right? So this is something that it's funny because what you hit on is, again, one of the big fights that I don't think ever really goes away in the corporate law space about is corporate law the right locus of governance, right? So I'm kind of reminded of some of the ESG battles that are raging in corporate and securities law, right? One side wants corporations to be more involved in this and securities regulators to make a more active role. Um, and the other side says, why on earth do you want Elon Musk deciding how to manage environmental issues, right? Because that's what it means to have companies care a lot about ESG. Again, just for the nerds that don't know what, you know, 8Ks in, in EF. ESG is it would be environmental, social, and corporate governance. That's right. So, so you know, there's a big. It's a very, very similar idea. And in fact, you could think of this question about impacting elections as a social issue. It's an ESG issue. It's should this company care about the social ramifications of its decisions, right? And so, I think the the way we would normally think about this in corporate law is: Do you really want the CEO of Twitter deciding elections? I mean, what you were just describing to me is like terrifying, this idea of this butterfly effect that like some guy in some office somewhere gets to ultimately decide the course of an election. Gosh, I mean, we have governments so that they can make rules so that they can like think about bigger picture stuff. I don't know that I want the CEO of some, you know, private or public company making these types of decisions. Welcome to my world. Well, no, exactly. Yeah. You know, people who want exactly the same substantive outcomes can like violently disagree on whether corporate law is the right locus of decision making on this. And, you know, I think the, the corporate law absolutists, as I sometimes call them, think that we should use corporate law to decide everything. And, you know, on one hand, I have some sympathy for this because, you know, the Delaware Chancery Court is extremely efficient. The legislature is extremely responsive. So if I had to pick some government to decide everything in my life, I mean, it wouldn't be the worst one. On the other hand, it does feel a little bit strange uh, to make this a matter of corporate law to me, given that that's just not what corporate law is set up to do. Uh, so, you know, to your narrow question, is there enough leeway in the precedence for McCormick to you know, come to whatever decision she wants? I mean, she can't come to whatever decision she wants. And, and I don't think she would want to. I think she's a careful jurist who wants to make the right decision. But, you know, I think we've still got discovery to go through, and I'm certainly not willing to make any hard and fast predictions about what the outcome is going to be. Yeah, because I think, you know, it's really striking to me that point that you were making about, you know, do we really want CEOs of companies to be deciding all of these issues, which you know, that's something that I've been thinking about for a long time. And, and it's been the discussion in this area for a very long time. Apparently you're a corporate scholar. Right. Yeah. But, but, but that's how I kind of, I, I feel uh, like I've been rendered irrelevant. You know, I've been thinking about it in terms of like first amendment issues and the public private divide and, you know, all of this uh, kind of stuff. And you're telling me that Revlon uh, is, is going to be uh, the, the, the deciding case here. It just seems kind of wild from, from that perspective. I mean, do you have an opinion on how, you know, you were saying, do we really want corporate law to be deciding this? I guess another way of saying is, does corporate law have tools to be less cold and transactional about this? Um, is there a trend in corporate law in terms of thinking about this? I mean, you know, it's funny. Why is it? I mean, we're literally talking about transactional law. So right. I mean, it, it is, in fact, transactional. That is a, That is an accurate description. But only if you're really formalistic about this. Like, I think that that describes the divide between the two of us, perhaps. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. I don't know that it's funny because Chancery is a court of equity. It's not like a formalistic thing. Uh, and I, I don't know if formalistic is the way I would think about it. I think, but maybe it's sort of a, a separation of duties kind of argument. It come, you know, who's supposed to be deciding these things now? And again, this is like, it's so funny because you say this is what you've been thinking about for years and years. This is also what everybody in corporate law has been arguing about for years and years. So again, like secretly, we're actually in the same field because when you think about these social issues like elections or when you think about carbon emissions, right? So we don't all like literally die. 
the question is not should something be done. I mean, that is a question that some people ask, but it's it's not like a particularly interesting question from my perspective. The question is who ought to be the one doing it? Uh, now, maybe, and I think this is a reasonable thing to say, maybe the answer you would give is, look, there's nobody else right now. And so if Chancellor McCormick is going to save us, like more power to her. But it's sort of weird to think that like Delaware M&A law is what's going to save us from what's going to save American democracy. Right? Like that's that's strange. And so the idea that there would be tools in Delaware M&A law to like save democracy is itself like a hard thing for me to even wrap my head around. Does that, do you know what I mean? I mean, if it's hard for you to wrap your head around, um, imagine the rest of us that are just learning uh, the first things about Delaware uh, M&A law. Yeah, I mean, it, it is funny because I obviously think about this in terms of like the First Amendment and, and, and free speech issues. And I'm feeling like, you know, that might be all trumped by this Delaware M&A law. But of course, that's not the end of the story here. And we have in parallel all of these questions playing out in the courts about the First Amendment rights uh, of, of companies and whether the government can regulate and, and, and trump those rights, trump, no pun intended, trump those rights and force uh, those companies <laughs> to moderate in a certain way whatsoever. So it may look like corporate law, um, you know, wins the day in October, but there's this longer arc uh, happening uh, about, you know, the, the, the public-private divide in terms of whether the these First Amendment rights of these companies to do whatever they want, uh, whether they may end up being more constrained in this area than currently seems to be so well, that's exact so that's exactly the kind of thing i have in mind see i don't actually know anything about the first amendment but right so when i say what is the the right locus of governance the question is not should somebody do something the question is do you want the delaware court of chancery and, and possibly the delaware legislature because after all they're the ones that you know get to write delaware corporate law do you want them deciding or do you want like the ftc which presumably has like some expertise in the area of, you know, anti-competitive stuff, if that's what you're worried about? Or do you want like, I don't know, whoever funds elections, there's like a whole agency for them, right? I don't know, let, let, maybe they know a little bit more about it than Chancellor McCormick, who's super duper smart. And again, like I would, I would happily delegate the management of my life to her, but I, I'm not sure that's great for democracy either. Well, I guess what this means is we'll meet again as our two areas of uh, study collide in this totally bizarre way. And of course, we'll have to get you back on as this plays out. And if we do see something happen in October, uh, we'll have to have a viewing party. So thanks very much for coming on and explaining this to all of us. You are very, very welcome. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to Arbiters of Truth, the Lawfare podcast series on our online information ecosystem. You can find past episodes in the Lawfare podcast feed, as well as our separate Arbiters of Truth podcast feed. And we'll be back with another episode next Thursday. Please rate and review wherever you get your podcasts. The Lawfare podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare podcasts by becoming a Lawfare material supporter at patreon.com forward slash lawfare. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. The podcast was edited by Jen Patya Howell. Our audio engineer this episode was Kara Schillen of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed, as always, by Sophia Yan. Thank you for listening. <laughs>